You know how some carriers give you so little for your older busted phone you just end up living with it? I don't think so. Verizon lets you trade in your broken phone for a shiny new one. You break it, we upgrade it. You dunk it, doggy bone it. <laughs> Slam it, wham it, strawberry jam it. We upgrade it. Get a 5G phone on us with select plans. Every customer, current, new, or business. Because everyone deserves better. And with plans starting at just $35, better cost less than you think. Bill Duke, what's up, man? Good to be here, brother. God bless you for thanking, thanking for being here. Indeed, How you, how's it going? Been blessed, man. Been working, man, and doing things in, in these very challenging times. My right. family's good. Had one friend die from COVID. My godson had it, but he got through it, so we feel blessed to still be here, man. So you say you were working. You've been uh, working on some interesting stuff. And, and one of the things that, uh, when, I, when I talked to, Richard Lawson said this, he said, I like being old school, but operating in a 21st century world. Yes, understood totally. You have to keep going, reinventing yourself, and not give up. I don't want to retire because I enjoy what I do. When you retire, everything retires, I think. Mm -hmm. So if you keep going, like you have been going for years and still have it all together, that's what I, I only be like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like, for me, it, it is the, <clears throat> it is the, the, the joy, it's, it, so it's like even, like, even before we started shooting, this is the perfect example. For me, it's the joy of, and I'll tell Mario Van Peebles this, of the shot. You like, damn, that shot looks good. It was, so like right before we hit record, I'm sitting here and I was like, are we getting that light that's behind? Right, right. That, that, that's what still interests me and, and, and piques my interest is, it's the shot, it's, it's that camera movement. It's the, you know, so so I, that's the thing for me. So, so if I play it back, oh, I like that, I like, Oh, I like what we did right there. And that, that's, that's what still does it for me. Yes, me too. Um, people always ask me, what do you prefer, directing or acting? I said, I love acting, but directing? I mean, you have the ability to have a voice visually. And that's something that's wonderful. You know, the way you see things, it gives it validity. Right. And so that's something that I, I'm, I'm to, I understand totally what you're saying. That's, when we last talked, I told you, I, I, I literally watch High Flying Bird every three months. I, I mean, I, and I just, I mean, I've seen that. I could, I mean, but it's, it's, I watch it and I'm, I'm, I'm just watch that movement. The, ooh, I like that angle. I like how, ooh, that was tight. And I like how, you know, I just like, matter of fact, we were, cover, we were covering a march we were covering the march in off the march for democracy, and we were marching with the marchers. And so, Anthony took a rest. I grabbed the camera, and so it was some, some different stuff I was trying or whatever. And and that to me is what still is just so interesting. That 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 sometimes like it'll keep me up at night. I'll be watching stuff, and I'm, I'm st looking at it and like, oh, I want to try that next time we go out and shoot. Oh, I want to. Oh, I want to. Oh, I like how those those colored that's lights right. were used. Right. Oh, I want to use that. That, that. That's the thing to me. That uh, the, the, the experiential that that, that that keeps your mind going and flowing. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned High Flying Bird. I think you know this, but it was shot. Yeah. With five iPhone Seven Plus. That's why I watch it. And when and when they did their dolly shots, they rolled them around well, in real time. Right. Because he said, because the story I read, you know Soderbergh, Soderbergh said that had we done a traditional track, I, I, I mean, I remember it was he was you know, it was coming down a hallway off an elevator, and he said with the wheelchair, 
he, he curved around this way as the characters went that way. He said, a traditional track, I couldn't have gotten that shot. That's right. So that's, that's what I'm saying. So th that's the thing. And I forgot the story I was, they said, he, he, he shot with iPhones and I forgot to say the size of his favorite light. I forgot the size, in, in the story they said, mm -hmm. he shot all these scenes with, with his favorite light. Right. And, it was, he said, and it was just like, and, and that was, and th that was what I'm saying, but that, that's the curiosity uh, where the satisfaction comes in. The other people may not get it and may not, see it which, which i think is what keeps the juices flowing and the creativity and then it's like oh new technology we can add this and oh we can we can add this and this that to me i think is is, is what is so interesting well it's your vision you know what i'm saying your, your your specific way of seeing life of seeing the scene the context putting that all together in my opinion is exciting and of course, it takes study and craft and the rest of it, but it's worth it because when you see it on screen, that's how you imagine it, that's how you saw it, and nothing wrong with that. When you are, you, 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 you did work at Howard University. And I, I, I used to be the head of the Department of Radio, Television, and Film. When you were there, and even now, do you have the sense that folks who want to direct really are locked in st and studying the craft? <laughs> it's okay. I can tell by the, by, by the look of your face and the laugh, you're like, hell no. Because that's, that, that's the difference. That, look, as you know, the craft of anything takes time, commitment, and study. The craft of it. You can take a camera and a sound system and shoot something, but is it crafted? And it reminds me of a story that um, a pastor friend of mine told me. He said, one Sunday, he said, um, in terms of the craft, nobody wants to do the craft of it. So he said, everybody who wants to go to heaven, stand up and sing hallelujah. Everybody stood up five minutes. Calm down, calm down. Everybody who wants to die, stand up and sing hallelujah. Nobody stood up. He said, how are you going to go to heaven if you don't die? So everybody wants to go to heaven, but the studying of the craft, as you know, you have to do it. You have to study it. It takes time to learn the the beginning, middle, and end of a story, the beginning, middle, and end of a character. You know, what, what is a camera? What does it do? Right. What does a camera do? Right. Because camera tells stories, right? right? But nobody wants to do that. My, my, so my niece, my niece works for me. And um, I, have a, I have a very small, it's a Sony HD camera. And then I've got, you know, got three X, Canon XA25, three XF405, three C300s. And I said, so I'm gonna get, get this camera for you to shoot. And so I said, um, do, you, do you know how to shoot the camera? She said, yes. I said, no, you don't. I said, you know how to turn it on. You know how to press record. But you know how to use that camera. Mm -hmm. And I said, have you gotten intimate with the camera? <laughs> so have you studied the camera? Studied the camera. I said, have you got? Have you grabbed the manual and literally gone through all the functions? And what does it do? Mm -hmm. I said, have you pushed the camera to its limits? That's right. I said, I said, you don't know how to use the camera. <laughs> and I was, I was trying, I was trying to get her to understand that just pointing and shooting. I said, that's not it. That's why when my my producers. I tell them, I want you to shoot. I say, but I don't want you to shoot with view. I don't want you to shoot with a monitor. Right. So you take, so you got a monitor on top of that camera there. You got to, I tell them, I don't want you to shoot. I said, I want you to shoot looking into the eyepiece. Yes. And so when I was a TV, one of my producers said, she's like, why? I said, because when you shoot into the eyepiece, I said, you are seeing the subject. I said, when, 
I said, when you shoot with that video monitor, I said, you're actually seeing what's above the monitor, to the left, the bottom, and the right. I said, but when you end that eyepiece, you're looking at it, and you, I said, you're actually as an emotional connection with, with what you're seeing. I said, so then when you go into editing, then your first thing is, man, I wish we had this shot and this shot and this shot. I said, so now if you shoot as a producer, when you now go out, you now have developed an eye for what you actually want. Yes. For that photo to get for you, for you when you edit. That's right. And they were like, I said, I don't want you to just be a producer. I said, but did you need to see it and feel it to understand mm -hmm. how to actually be a better producer? Yes. Well, what you're talking about is not only people seeing it, but feeling and experiencing it. it. Yes. Totally different thing. Yeah. And that takes the craft and skill, as you say. What are you looking at? What are you feeling? If you don't feel nothing, then how do you expect me to feel? Does that make any sense? You know how some carriers give you so little for your older busted phone you just end up living with it? I don't think so. Verizon lets you trade in your broken phone for a shiny new one. You break it. We upgrade it. You dunk it, doggy bone it. <laughs> Slam it, wham it, strawberry jam it. We upgrade it. Get a 5G phone on us with select plans. Every customer, current, new, or business. Because everyone deserves better. And with plans starting at just $35, better cost less than you think. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Showed you the art of the craft of the of the who who said Bill? No, this is how you direct. This is this is what you look for. Um, I'll tell you, going to the American Film Institute when Tony Vellani was there was an incredible experience for me. But one of the people who gave me passion was Gordon Parks. Mm. Gordon Parks didn't just shoot. He knew how to tell a story mm. emotionally. Mm -hmm. And so when she's running across the field or whatever, you felt it, right? Because he gave you the understanding of the moment visually. Mm -hmm. not, not just, I mean, it wasn't, she didn't say anything. But when she ran across the field or they did something, you felt it. And that's, that's a craft. I think it's also, when we start talking about, again, part of this, this, this craft, I, people think visually, but the value of sound. Uh, Steve McQueen's 12 Years a Slave. What I love about that, and it was, and, and, and part of the reason, I guess, for me, I, I, I get it, because I only have hosting the show and doing interviews, whatever, but I went to communications high school where they taught us to value the credits after the movie. Yes. My, my teacher, Mary Waits, would make us, we had to watch the film to the end of the credits. She said, this is how the movie got made. Yes. But I still watch credits. I don't, right. I, I literally don't leave till the credits are over. But watching that, I, I loved how he used these long moments of silence and all you heard were the crickets in the water or whatever. And it was a trip watching it because there's a natural moment of, of silence. But then after, you know what you pick up. And I'm watching it and I, I'm literally going, damn, he made that go 15, 18, 20 seconds. And watching that movie, it's amazing how silence actually became its own character. 
You are 100% right, and that's a brilliant observation. You know, when watching a movie or when you're acting, I, I hate the word acting because it sounds like pretending, but acting is rel actually becoming. After you learn the lines, I tell my students when I'm teaching acting, you fall into darkness backward. Mm. You're not quite sure where you're going, but you trust something in you. So we're, we're in a scene together. One of the most important things is how I listen to you. Mm. It's not I'm waiting to say my next line. Right, right. But I'm listening to what you're saying and what it means to me, and I respond from that. Does that make any sense? Well, anyway, because, because, because look, we've done multiple interviews today, and there was no agenda with any interview. So no one was pitching a movie, no one was pitching a book, no one was, and, and so there literally were, I have no questions. <laughs> now, I have knowledge of the subject, the person I'm talking to, I have knowledge of their background, but I literally have no idea where the interview is going. Right. Which means that I actually have to listen to understand where I'm going. Otherwise, it's just sort of there. Well, um, listening is a rare craft these days. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's wonderful to talk to somebody that really listens to what you're saying. And sometimes before they speak, they really hear you. Mm -hmm. And that determines their response. Right, precisely. Tone, whether it's melancholy, whether they're sad, whether they laugh, whatever, that now can change the direction of the conversation. That's right. And when, you, and when you're working in a film, it's like the other act you're working with determines to a great extent your performance. You know, it's like, Many, I tell this story at the time, many, many years ago, um, I was acting in this film with this new director, right? I was having trouble with the scene. And so I go up to him, he's a young director, I think it was his second film. And I said, I'm having trouble with this monologue here, you know, can you help me out, understand it better? He looked at me and he said, um, make it more blue. Make it more blue. <laughs> Like sky blue, blue light. This is like 15 years ago. I still don't know what he was talking about. Ma make it more, make it more blue. blue. <laughs> Do you know what that means? I mean, Miles Davis kind of blue. <laughs> blue suede shoes. <laughs> wow. I had no idea. I just knew I was on my own. Now, now, as somebody who is a director, but you're acting, is that when your director side go, you don't know what the hell you doing? That's right. <laughs> well, you know, because that's of, not direction. It's not direction. But a lot of directors, you know, the camera, you know, lenses, they know sound, etc., and editing. But working with actors and, and having, because as actors, we have to trust you. Right. And so that, you know, because we're, we're, when we're, we're vulnerable. So we need you to really guide us and help us. And when we have moments of doubt, reassurance of some kind or putting some direction that makes it work for us. But to talk to somebody that has no idea what acting is, mm -hmm. that's a very, it's a challenging experience. There have been uh, a, a number of roles that you've played in, um, a number of, it, it was interesting, even when I look at the comedic roles you play, you don't get the comedic lines, but you end up being so serious <laughs> that it ends up being funny. Right, right. Have you ever actually done just 
a comedy? Uh, unfortunately, not really, no. See, that's the... Okay, so I interviewed Courtney B. Vance. Yeah. It was the same thing. Courtney, the, all of these serious roles. And I, I had my show. I said, Courtney, when you going to do, bro, a comedy? Just... And it was... So, it, it, see, he was like, he said, bro, it's a good idea. Blah, blah. He said, it never really hasn't happened. And then when he did uh, Office Christmas, uh, yes. Office Christmas yes. Party. Oh, my God. First of all, that movie is crazy. And I was so happy to see him. And so even though he played this serious guy, it, it, it was, cra- I was cracking up laughing. <laughs> and when I saw him, and so, and that's, so, so that's, so that's, ne- there's never an opportunity to do that. Have you, have you wanted to do that? Well, you know, the closest I've come to that, and people laugh at that scene every time they see it, and I swear to God, I've traveled around the world, as you know, and every time I go to a country, they repeat this line, from minister to society. Of course. You know what I'm saying? Of course. It is <laughs> one of the, <laughs> look, there are people who play the game of movie lines. Bottom line, it is one of the most iconic <laughs> lines in cinematic history. <laughs> and they think, they think it's funny. It is, <laughs> but it's but obviously that it wasn't that was it wasn't designed to be that way. No, it's this no. serious scene. Yes. How many times have you done shows where they said you got to do the line? Well, you know, it depends on the director. You know what I'm saying? And it's like working with creative people. They give you freedom. Now, was that written or did you come up with that? No, it was written. So it was written that way? Yeah. So when you, okay, so when you read it, when you read it, you were like, <laughs> now, did you, re, did you refine how you did it or the moment you read it, you knew, I'm going to play it this way? Um, I, I kind of knew, you know, how can I say this? The character came to me. Right. And... When I went in the room with the darkness. Right, right. And this little kid, like, you know, I felt like, how can I say, my father, when, if we ever lied to him. Right, right. <laughs> he lied. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I became his father. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? See, see I know <laughs> yeah. that feel because it was when you went, what? time it's like it was like the slow if you lie to me one more time that's, right. that's like they slow down. it's like they enunciate every second. that's exactly if right you lie to me that's one right. more that's right. time i'm that's gonna right. slap the shit out that's of you right. that, that's what that i'm telling it's it is i'm telling i don't care what man i will put i will go to youtube and play that damn scene you know you fucked up right that's right that's right that you know, it's like it reminds me, you know, when, true story, man, if my sister and I were little kids and my father and mother told us not to ride our bikes on the street, but the sidewalk, in those days there was like a community. Yes. So if Mrs. Johnson next door, so my sister and I riding our bike on the street, she would stand in front of us, told us to get our butts in her house in the living room and put her bikes on her porch. She would say, don't say a word. She would get on her phone and call my father at work and say, Bill, they rode the bikes on the street. My father would say, I'll be there in an hour. <laughs> that was the longest hour. Precisely. Oh, I know of that. Of our feels- lives. Because we, we... Oh, you know about to happen. <laughs> you, my, my, my niece decided not to turn in homework for a couple of months. <laughs> now, my wife dealt with, we've raised six of my nieces on numerous occasions. Mm-hmm. My wife was like, you're going to have to go to the school. Now, now I'm already pissed. Because <laughs> see, now I got to stop what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So, man, I go to the school. It's my oldest niece, Atlantis, one who worked for me. So I go to, so I, 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 I go 
to her, to, to her, to her room. I said, where's her desk? So I go, I teach you 10 minutes. I go, I, I'm pulling shit out the desk. <laughs> I'm pulling, I mean, it's stuff like stuff all, uh-huh. I'm put all homework and stuff. Uh-huh. I said, how many assignments has she not turned in? Mm. So I'm done. So I'm about to leave. So I'm leaving. And they coming back from lunch and I turn that corner and they all lined up and she see a bunch of sh- <laughs> hey. And that's all I said. Uh-huh. See your ass up to school. <laughs> That's right. So I know for the next uh, four hours, she was. Right. So I go to school, pick her up. And it was literally, if you take that scene and I'm driving, get your ass, turn in your homework. Mm-hmm. No. You know what's going to happen when we get home, right? That's right. What's going to happen? Uh-huh. I'm going to get a whip. No. I'm going to beat your ass. <laughs> that's, 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 exact, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> Look, man. There are consequences. But, Ron, here's the thing. Today, if you spank them, that's abuse. No. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, though, right? You, you know they can, they can call 911 on you now. Got as, as the comedian Thea Vidal said, you got, she said her daughter's like, mommy, I can call, uh, I can call a cop. She said, bitch, you gotta get, you gotta get to the phone. <laughs> I'll never forget, Thea Vidal, comedian, she said, she said, help her, you gotta get to the phone. You get to the phone first. She said. I love it. She said, you gotta get to the phone I first. I love it, I love it, yes. But, it's, but, it, but it is, <laughs> and I know, I, know, I know you probably, I know you have to be saying, I have done all these movies. I have directed and acted and that is the one, it's crazy. I was, I was in Japan. I'm walking down the street. These two young boys pass by me. They turn, you, you, you. I say, yeah. You build Duke, you build Duke. I said, yeah. You know you don't puck up, right? <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't even say the word. <laughs> You know you don't fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh so hard, man. You know how some carriers give you so little for your older busted phone you just end up living with it? I don't think so. Verizon lets you trade in your broken phone for a shiny new one. You break it. We upgrade it. You dunk it, doggy bone it. <laughs> Slam it, wham it, strawberry jam it. We upgrade it. Get a 5G phone on us with select plans. Every customer, current, new, or business. Because everyone deserves better. And with plans starting at just $35, better cost less than you think. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. There are five movies that are on my list of all time black cult classics that if you have not seen, you cannot come back to my show. <laughs> like literally, uh-huh. you cannot come back to my show. <laughs> I have, I've had people on my show, conversation come up and I would say, have you seen Cooley High? If they say no, I'm like, you are not a lot. I will snatch black cards. Car wash is one of those five. Mm-hmm. You're playing Abdullah. Yes. You playing and you and you play, and th- that is, and so same thing. That that that. Why do you think car wash is also iconic? 
Why? Well, I think one, the great Michael Schultz, great director, great human being. But at that time, you know, I don't even think I was acting, man. I was, I was that angry. Really? I think. Because man, you were filled with rage in that movie. Well, you know, at that time. What year was that? That was car wash was seventy. I look it up. Don't worry about it. Nine was it? Seventy eight, seventy nine. I look it up. Keep going. Isn't that amazing? Is that amazing that you can do that right now? That's right. Do you do you know that I had one of the first cell phones? You know how big it was? That sucker was the size of a boulder. <laughs> you remember, remember, remember that? Suck, man, that was a brick. I thought I was so cool. You could, you could <laughs> hold a steel door open with that phone. It's the truth, man. That bad boy there was car wash released October 22nd, 1976. 76. That was three weeks. That was two weeks before the presidential election. Mm hmm. So when y'all, sh- so that was released, so you shot that, obviously, before. So you said, so you, were, you were angry. It was the context of the times, you know, there were, there were rioting, there was anger, there was a lot of things, and I felt a lot of Abdul with the character, and I think that's why uh, Michael casted me, he knew me as a friend, because we were at the Negro Ensemble Company together, and when I was at NYU School of the Arts, he was there too, and I think he knew that I felt that human being, and that's why he hired me to do it, you know, but I just thought the writing in it, the directing in it, and the people in it, Antonio Fark, you know, the Pointer Sisters, Richard Pryor scene, George Carlin, that supporting cast right. of people, it, Danny DeVito, it was kind of a conglomerate of good folks, you know? But I, but. But you also had you, you. But you also had this, this cultural. I mean, you had, you had the gay folks, you had Native Americans, right. you had the Jewish uh, son uh, and the owner. You had. I mean, so you 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 had a a melting pot of a movie in 1976, and I didn't realize until I saw one of the retrospectives that. Because it aired on NBC that that it was too black for them. That I, that there were more they, they made they made Michael put more of the white characters in the TV version than was in the movie version. Mm. Mm. And they said, "Now that's too black." Really, I did not know that. If you, you didn't know that? No, I didn't know that. I actually saw retrospective. So if you watched the TV version. You see all these white characters that were not actually major parts in the movie. Wow. He did a retrospect, and, he, and, he, and, and, he, and Michael said, and I've been trying to, I've been sitting out interview Michael, he said, yeah, that they were like, no, 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 uh-uh, that the movie was too black. Wow. And they had, they had to whiten, whiten it for it to air on, on a network television. That's the reality. Um in those days, it was, I don't think people <clears throat> really understand the evolution of things, you know? What we came from to where we are today and all of the obstacles that were faced at that time uh, because I think young people today just think this is the way it always was. Mm-hmm. When we came up, there was no internet. There was no social media. There were no real self, you remember those? Yeah, see, this here, but, but the movie, when Cartwatch came out, you also were, King gets killed, because you write about it in your book, um, Bill Duke, My 40 Year Career on Screening Behind the Camera. King gets killed in 68. This movie only comes out eight years after King's assassinated. That's right. So, it, and I, I, that's also, I think, people don't realize. So, so those, the times operating in, uh, which all, we also made it a, a lot different. You were talking about, again, those moments. And I, wanted, I want you to talk about, because you, you write about it in the book, where you talk about, the section is called the business. Most people focus on the show, but neglect the business. Yes. How how do you how do you have had to learn that? How, what, what was there something that where 
was there was there was a point where you were focused on the show and not the business, and then something happened where you went, oh hold up, I better know, I better understand the business of the business. I um, I came up in New York um, as a stage. Wrote, I wrote plays and. Um, for the stage and directed my own plays, etc. Went through that whole process and became an actor in New York and went to School of the Arts and um, had a good acting career, etc. Uh, and I was always interested in directing film, but I was intimidated by the cameras, the lights, the sides of the crews and everything. And so um, I was just like, you know, was afraid to do all that. I was in a sh TV show called Palmer's Town, USA. Oh, no, I said it. Palmer's Town, USA? Yeah, it was on CBS. Yes. Yes. Uh, Norman Lear? No, I remember, I watched and, the show. And Alex Haley? Yes. No, oh, I remember the show. Yeah, two seasons. And I thought I had made it. It was like set in the South. Cause I, yes. Yeah, because I, cause I remember, black I remember you wearing overalls. That's right, black family in the white No, 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 no I remember. Right? Yes. And I thought, hey, a TV series, da 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 da. After the series was canceled, I did not work for two years. Wow. And that's when I said, hmm, I think I better get over my fear of directing so I have other options. And that's when I went to the American Film Institute and started my directing training there. And so that's, you know, that was a light bulb for me. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's the point that you just made there was interesting. Uh, Tashina Arnold, I, I saw her speak uh, here at an event in L.A., and she said it was 10 years when Martin got canceled where she got another sitcom. And she said, you know, here I'm thinking, oh, you know, hit show, whatever. She said it was a decade be between Martin and Everybody Loves Chris. She said 10 years. 10 years. Wow. You have to have, how can I say, those are not painless times. Because people think rejection, or you just get over it, right? But you don't, man. You, they say don't take it personally, but when you're rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected, right. something happens. And so to survive that, I mean, you have to have tenacity, reinvent yourself, self-worth, because what they're saying is that you're not worthy. You're not worth anything. And so you can't believe that, but I'm just simply saying it's, it hits you. 10 years is a long time not to work. That's a long time. You know how some carriers give you so little for your older busted phone, you just end up living with it? I don't think so. Verizon lets you trade in your broken phone for a shiny new one. You break it, we upgrade it. You dunk it, doggy bone it. <laughs> Slam it, wham it, strawberry jam it. We upgrade it. Get a 5G phone on us with select plans. Every customer, current, new, or business. Because everyone deserves better. And with plans starting at just $35, better cost less than you think. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. How did you get into this? Did you, did it just happenstance? Was it accident? Was it, how? Let me tell you um, the truth about how I got my first directing job. Um, I went to AFI and studied directing. And I was there for a couple of years and I did a film called The Hero, 
and it won a couple of awards and stuff, you know. So I had an agent and we went around and shopped it around because I wanted to get a TV directing gig or a film directing gig. And everybody said, no, 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 no. I got depressed. It's fine, a year I did that. I went away, I do transcendental meditation, went to a meditation retreat. My agent calls me and says, hey, Bill, come back. David Jacobs at Knott's Landing wants to talk to you. I rush back to L.A. I go over to David Jacobs' office, who was, who, who, who was a Knott's Landing producer. The, the meeting lasted for five minutes around. And I said, what, the, what is this about? My wisdom. Five mind. minutes? Five minutes. And I just, he just told me to leave. So my agent, I said, we wasted my time. He said, oh. A week later, my agent calls me and says, Bill, David wants you to direct an uh, episode of Nice Land. I said, what? So we're in pre-production for, for, for seven days. And Joel, the, uh, line, the uh, line producer, comes to me and says, Bill, you did a great job in pre-production. Well, we could tell you're going to be a great director from your reel. I said, what reel? Well, the reel from your other shows. I said, no, no, I just got out of AFI. Just, I just got... He said, wait a minute. He goes into David Jacobs' office. David Jacobs had mixed my box up with somebody else's. <laughs> That's how I got my first job as a director. Wow. <laughs> Am I lying? Wow. God has a sense of humor, right? That's <laughs> it. What real? <laughs> it's a real. Well, of all the other shows that you directed, I said. <laughs> you like, no, I'd be another Bill Do. <laughs> That's how I got my first job as a TV director. That is crazy. It's a true story. What was their response when you said, that ain't mine? The, I shot the next day. They followed me around for two days to make sure I knew what I was doing. Now, now were you nervous the whole time? Like, I could be fired. I mean, you know, it was like, you know, I knew what I was doing, but they were like, yeah, we don't know your ass know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. They followed you around like a black person with, with, by the security in the in the in, in, That's right. in at the, at the mall. That's right. Exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> it was so. How did they like the episode? They loved it. I, I went back and did several episodes after that. Wow. David Jacobs is one of the reasons that I'm in the business. I had my career because because he. <laughs> He laughs, and when it was, he laughed so hard. He laughed so hard, it was like, I made a mistake, but it's a mistake, I'm, I like, I'm glad I made it. That <laughs> is crazy. It's the true story, man. That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they were like, let's go back and, what? did you actually have a reel? No, I, ha I had that one film I did, <laughs> Did they go back and watch that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they just <laughs> they couldn't hire another director because it was the first day of shooting. Right. So uh, they had to let me do it. That means God has a sense of humor, right? Yeah, that's no, that's 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 funny. <laughs> they got your real mixed up, mixed up with somebody else. But well, what would you say? TV show, stage, movie, the most absolute, so I'm going to ask two, what was the most fun you had as an actor and a director, doesn't matter what, what it was, the, directing or acting, the most, what, what project, what movie, was it a movie, was it TV, was it big screen, was it was it stayed? Was it off Broadway? Where you where you just had fun? Uh, I would say the most fun I ever had. One of the greatest people that is doesn't get the credit he deserves. No event peoples mm. ain't supposed to die a natural death on Broadway. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible cast of people, um, as you know. 
acting on stage is different from being in a film. You don't get no second takes. Right. You do it or you don't. See, that's why I like live TV. I'm the same. That red light, come on. Play, it's time to go. Time to go in. Uh, directing wise, Sister Act 2 with Whoopi was great. It was great. And also, um, Deep Cover with Lawrence Fishburne and oh, Jeff Goldblum. Oh, man. Those guys, to work with those guys, see how serious they are? The two of the funniest people. Great oh. sense of humor, you know? The, one, of the, the, one of the best scenes was the sister, I cannot remember her name, she played the love interest. When they were arguing, she's like, you're fucking up my high. Oh my God. I, I didn't, I, cause I, read, cause I read later, because she stopped acting because I think she has MS. Yes. And I saw, and I saw, and, uh, cause I was wondering what, what happened to her. Uh, but that, 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 I remember that because there was a guy, I worked, I worked at the Austin American Statesman. I forgot the, his name, was a television critic. Uh, you probably know, and, and he, in his review, he said, Deep Cover should have been Oscar nominated. That, that was, Thank you. That 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 move that was a that movie was no joke. I have that that DVD is in my collection. Oh, beautiful! Thank you for that. Thank no, you. Deep cover, the deep cover. That was Goldblum, Fishburne. That was intense. I, I really enjoyed it. They were great to work with. The collaboration between the two of them, and they didn't give a hundred. They give a thousand percent. I mean. Wonderful actors, but great people and talented, and they came ready. And um, it was a great experience. What was the most intense that took a lot out of you to do? Oh. When I did Hoodlum, Mm. In Chicago, there was a day that we worked 28 hours straight without sleep. Why? Behind schedule, had to make it up. Wow. The studio said, you wasting time and money. And so, and Around the 26th hour, we were all exhausted, you know? And I don't know who it was. We were, we were on a lunch break. Somebody started laughing. And you know that when you're hysterical, everybody started laughing at the same time for maybe 10 minutes. Because <laughs> Richard. Yes. That, that, that's, that's called that tired laugh. You know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, was, it, 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 it was intense. It was intense. 28 hours straight. 29. See, that's the thing that, again, you talk about the business of the business. People don't see. You're the director. You, and when they say, Robert Townsend talked about this here when he had five heartbeats. When they said, Robert, you don't, you don't get this done. The insurance folks are taking over. So when, you, so when you're directing... You, you ain't just floating and chilling. I mean, you got to keep this this train on. And are are they describe? Are they literally on set, like hour by hour, minute by minute, saying it costs this, this, this. They may they 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 many times they don't say it. They're just there, and their presence says it. See, people don't understand. See, directing has two components. The creative process. You and the writer and the producers work together for a vision. You gotta translate that vision to the actors, to the to the crew, to the staff, everybody. Sometimes almost a hundred people, right? So you have one vision going in and everybody is on the same page. The second part of directing is management. And you're managing three things: time, people and money. And if you can't manage time, people, and money, no matter how great a director you are, right. 
And is that something that when you are teaching, you might have a student who is extremely creative, but they can't do that. And you say, one does not work without the other. Uh, well, you may make the movie and then you should put it in your closet. Because <laughs> if you don't understand distribution, marketing and the rest of it, it's like your grandfather gave you $100,000. Well, how are you going to market it? How are you going to sell the movie? They give him his money back. Right. A lot of people have passion. I'm not saying anything against passion. Right. But passion without a plan is called frustration. See, I, I, I tell people, I, I, I often am, am saying to staff, to others, the business of the business. That, sure, you can go out and shoot a, is a great product. I mean, I, I have these conversations with folks all the time because, you know, with technology, but, oh man, this Sony camera and, and, and the red camera and, and, and oh my God, it looks so awesome. And I remember I was having this, and they were like, oh my God, look great. And I said, they're going to see it right here. That's right. I said, now, nah. I said, now, nah. C300, the body is 9,000. The Canon XF405 is 3,000. And the Canon XA25 was $19.99. I said, if the XA25 was in 29.9 frame, I said, we ain't streaming in 4K. Mm -hmm. And we ain't streaming it in no 6K, 8K. I said, so why am I going to sit here and spend a whole lot of time and money? I said, when? It's going to be two minutes right here. Right. And it was like, yeah, but it looks great. I said, yeah, but we ain't trying to sell this to a group of cinematographers. That's right. I said, we got to be able to eat. And a lot of people, as you're building, don't understand the business part. Before, before December, I couldn't afford to see 300s. So my whole deal was, no. We gonna figure out how to shoot this with them XA25s. And then we got a little bit more money, that's when we bought the 4K 405s. Mm -hmm. Then we bought, now we got 5 c 300 but, but it was under, no, no, I was like, no, this is the business of the business. That's right. I'm not about to sit here and kill us financially to try to afford to rent one C300 when, or buy one C300, hell, when I could buy three 4Ks. But, it's that, but that, that's the business part that a lot of folk don't take the time to understand. Well, you know, you for years have had the ability to do two things. The visual, the visual part of it, right? But like experts like yourself, what you're filming, you get people emotionally attached to it. Because no matter how, what they see, like you see a lot of action movies, explosions and da 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 Nobody cares about anybody who dies. Right. But to make people care. Right. Over the situation. Right? Right. See, what, what, I, what I try to tell folks is, um, you need to be able to shoot next week. <laughs> I'm like, you, you spend all your money this week, Okay, but can you shoot next week and then next month? That's right. And that's the thing that I think. And so when you talk about being a director, I, I remember when I remember when Selma, I read the story in Selma, and the story was on all of these directors who passed the movie up. I think Spike Lee passed, Lee Daniels passed, and all these directors said, "I, I, I can't make this for twenty five. And Ava DuVernay was like, "I can make it for twenty five million." She's like, oh, I, I, and so again, that was one of those things where she was like, no, we gonna figure this thing. That's right. And, and, that, and that's the piece I'm always saying, 
don't focus on, man, I wish we had this. I'm like, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. So let's figure out how we going to take this yes. and make a great product. That's right. Well, I, I, th I think that minorities and particularly black folks are alchemists. They gave us guts, turn them into chitlins. <laughs> and we still do that today. Mm -hmm. It's alchemy, right? Mm -hmm. And that what you give us... No, we're going to figure it out. We're going <laughs> to gonna figure it out. My grandfather could feed 50, 60 people in a house with two chickens and a pot of gumbo. <laughs> Everybody had a piece of meat. That's now, it right. wasn't a large piece of meat, but it's going, you got a piece of meat. That's right. In your gumbo bowl. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. And you will figure it out. That's right. You know how some carriers give you so little for your older busted phone, you just end up living with it? I don't think so. Verizon lets you trade in your broken phone for a shiny new one. You break it. We upgrade it. You dunk it, doggy bone it, <laughs> slam it, wham it, strawberry jam it. We upgrade it. Get a 5G phone on us with select plans. Every customer, current, new, or business. Because everyone deserves better. And with plans starting at just $35, better cost less than you think. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. I asked you earlier about comedy. What is it, you've done a lot, but what is it that you have yet to do that you really, really, really want to do? Is there a particular project? Is there something on the acting or directing that you say, I, I'm a, I got to do this? Well, actually there are several things, you know, there's, I'm trying to get it done for years, but it's been difficult. I want to do the Joe Lewis story. Mm. I don't, people don't really know who Joe Lewis really was. And it hasn't been, there have been documentaries, but there's not, right. He was an activist. Oh. Big time, people don't know that. For black golfers? Do you know what happened to him when he first tried to bring blacks to the golf clubs with him? Mm-hmm. That, they said, well, you can come in, Joe, but not the other people. He said, no, if you don't let my friends come in, I'm going to go to the papers. They said, okay, okay, yep, okay. Yep. So he brought his friends in, and when they hit the balls, and the balls went to the, to the holes, and they brought the, the, the balls out, it was covered with human feces. Mm hmm Human feces. Mm hmm that, That's one of the things he went through. And then, you know, that he, he did these fights around the world and made lots of money, but he took the money and donated it to the army uh, because he believed in the war. Mm -hmm. um, because he was an activist, um, they taxed him, you know this story, they taxed him on the dollars that he gave. And that's how he went broke. Right. So, after that's how you owe the government. And, and I just, I always wanted to, because I just admire him for who he was, what he did, one of the greatest fighters that ever lived. Because, the, 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 because what was, the, what has been created of Joe Lewis, oh, he was quiet, Joe, didn't say anything, as if, as if outside of the ring, he was just this, 
docile, meek figure. <laughs> no, 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 no. Demured. No, no, no. See, that's, and that's, but that's why who's telling the story matters. It's why who? I said, that's why who is telling the story matters. Yes. Because it's how you now frame a Joe Louis. That's right. Because I think if you ask the average person, it's when you see the films and it's, it's he wasn't, he was, he wasn't loud. He wasn't boisterous. No, he no, wasn't no, all no. of that. But that was something behind that, 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 that quiet, I call that quiet inferno. He, he loved us as a people. Um, he was respectful. He had his own self-caring, but he cared about us also. So he tried to leverage his celebrity to our benefit. Mm -hmm. And when that was seen, he was cast as a, mm, stay in your box. So you're not, you're jumping out your box, Joe. Right. You're giving your money, just shut up. And he didn't. Pay the price. Last question for you. I ask this of a lot of musicians and typically the work they cite is the one least appreciated by fans. So out of all the movies you starred in or directed in, what is your favorite? That, 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 that's for you, that you... Wow. That's a hard one, man. That's because there's, there's one every like every every musician will say it was this album didn't sell a lot, but it was this album. It was this song. It was it. So it, so again, not not it may be something we, we had never even saw. But but for you, it 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 meant something personal to you. You you it 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 it, it, it spoke to you. It it it, it was. I, I think I think that um, deep cover mm. because it talked about one of the major problems in our community, which is drugs. And the gentleman who wrote the book was a drug enforcement agent who was fired because he was dealing with what he called the mules on the street. You know those black folks that sold the drugs to each other on the street. And he said, well, when they wait, well, wait a minute, this is a white guy. They're not manufacturing it. They're not shipping it. They're not the, so he went to his bosses and said, hey, you know, I want to focus on the people and the office buildings and stuff that are blood there. They told him to shut up, mm -hmm. mind your business and deal with the mules. Mm -hmm. And he quit and wrote the book, and it was courageous. I just thought that that was, I, I really wanted to tell that story because, as you know, the drugs are dumped into our community, right. and we're seen as the, but I wanted to talk about how they got there and so on, so it was an important topic for me. Well, I, I dare say, first of all, folks should see that. They should absolutely get your book. Can I do a shameless pitch? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have three things, that, that book. I have another book that you can get on Amazon called uh, Works of the Invisible Man, which is my poetry book. And then there is uh, my network that's coming out called the Unite Network. And um, The Journey, which is another book about life's journey. So I'm, you know, like, like you, man, I never want to stop working, man. I, right. I love what I do. And so, don't know how much more time I have here, but I just want to keep doing what I love. Keep creating. It keeps you alive, right? That's right. That's right. Well, you talk about deep cover, and I know everybody loves in that iconic line in, in Menace to Society. But I dare say, if they watch High Flying Bird, they invented a game on top of a game. True story. And that's not just in sports.
true, brother. They invented a game on top, top of, a, of game. a game. That's right. That one line. But I still think my favorite scene, though, is when y'all in the office and Sonya son mentioned slavery and you like. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, and she's sitting here and then finally she's like, get the fuck out of my office. That's right. I love that scene. I love that scene. <laughs> When you were like, do not mention slavery in my presence. <laughs> you have, do I, I crack, and she was like, what, huh? Get the fuck out of my oh, That's right, exactly right. <laughs> I loved it, man. Oh my God, that cracks me up. That, that was, you know, again, working with Steven, man, is, he, he is a courageous director that deals with topics that are controversial, and that's why I like working with him. It's my third time working with him. Folks got to see it. I'll tell you. I, I love checking it out. I love it. Bill Duke, I appreciate it, my man. God bless you, man. Yes, sir. And thank you for your great work that you continue to do. I'm sincerely, man. I mean that. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.